In the last video, you learned that the molecule that contains the instructions to make proteins is DNA. But how do we know that? Remember, all the information in your textbook wasn't just handed to us on a silver platter. People back in the day had to actually go out and find this information for themselves. So our goal today is to answer two questions. One, how did scientists discover DNA? And two, why were they convinced that DNA held the instructions to make proteins? And by going through these questions, the goal is for you to see DNA as something that makes sense, rather than a bunch of concepts to memorize. Listen carefully. Our story starts in the 1800s. Back then, people knew about proteins, but they hadn't heard of DNA. And it stayed that way, until German scientists Schleiden, Wirko, and Buchli made the first discovery hinting at the existence of DNA. Now, these guys weren't interested in protein synthesis. In fact, Schleiden was a plant expert and Virko was a physician. But these three scientists had something in common. They tended to look at cells under microscopes a lot. Now, the problem with looking at cells is that cells are mostly colorless. I mean, they're 70% water. So it's kind of hard to see anything. So what these scientists did was put some dyes, some stain on their cells, and when they did that, they noticed something strange. While most of the cell was stained rather lightly, the scientists noticed that in the nucleus, there were these things that were stained very strongly, and they had no clue what these were. So naturally, these scientists went, I've discovered something new! And in science, when you've discovered a new thing, you tend to want to give that thing a name. And as you'll come to learn, Scientists are rather uncreative when it comes to naming things. It turns out that in Greek, the word color is chroma and body is soma. So these colored things were named chromosomes, literally meaning colored bodies. So Schleiden, Virko, and Buchli were excited. They discovered chromosomes. And the rest of the world was like, so what? All you did was find these colored things. You know nothing about them. And they were right, Schleiden, Virko, and Buchli didn't know anything about these chromosomes, what they did, or even what they were made of. But naturally, other scientists started coming up with guesses, or hypotheses. The most popular opinion back then was that these chromosomes were just a type of protein. Obviously today, we know that chromosomes aren't proteins, but they're instead large bundles of DNA. When thinking of the recipe book analogy from last video, you can think of a chromosome like a chapter of your recipe book. It's made of DNA and thus contains many genes, or protein recipes, but one chromosome is only part of the entire genome or recipe book. But of course, back in the 1800s, nobody knew this, so common belief was that chromosomes were just proteins. It wasn't until 1869 when Dr. Frederick Miescher actually tested to see whether chromosomes were in fact proteins. See, Miescher knew that proteins were made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. So he reasoned that if chromosomes were indeed proteins, then they too would have these same elements. So he tested it. He extracted a pure sample of chromosomes by grinding up cells, breaking them open, and using some salts and acids to isolate the chromosomes. And using the sample, Miescher did an elemental analysis. And he found that chromosomes contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And it was a lot of phosphorus. Remember, phosphorus isn't found in proteins, so Misha realized that these chromosomes couldn't be proteins. It seemed like these chromosomes were made of a substance that hadn't even been discovered before. So naturally, Misha went, let's give this substance a name. So Misha, uncreatively, thought, hmm, this substance is in the nucleus, so let's call it nucleic acid. So it was discovered that chromosomes were not a type of protein, but instead were made of nucleic acids. So the next step was to figure out what do these nucleic acids look like up close. We know that they're composed of these five elements, but these five elements can combine like this, or like this, or even like this. What's the actual molecular structure? It wasn't until almost 50 years later when biochemist Phoebus Levine figured it out. Through some experimentation, Levine found that the five elements combined like this, and sometimes like this, 
and like this, and sometimes like this. Levine found that the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus could combine in four different ways in chromosomes. The first thing that Levine noticed was that these structures were way smaller than the entire chromosome. So he hypothesized that these small molecules he discovered were, in a sense, building blocks for nucleic acids, that you had to combine many of these smaller molecules to build larger nucleic acids. Therefore, these building blocks of nucleic acids were uncreatively named nucleotides, with "-ide", meaning simple compound. Let's look at these nucleotides closely. We can see that all four have a negatively charged phosphate group and a 5-carbon sugar. In fact, this sugar is very similar to ribose sugar, but it's missing an oxygen right here, so this sugar is called deoxyribose. Therefore, Levine realized that nucleic acid wasn't a specific enough name, so it was instead called deoxyribose nucleic acid, or DNA. Today, we know that there's another type of nucleic acid, but with ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose, which we call RNA. So DNA and RNA are the two types of nucleic acids. But back to the four DNA nucleotides. Yes, they all have a phosphate group and a deoxyribose sugar, but this part right here is different between the four nucleotides. So of course, Levine thinks, let's give these things a name. This time, the scientists went, hmm, these things have a lot of nitrogens in them, so let's call them nitrogenous bases. They were called nitrogenous bases. But there were also four types of nitrogenous bases, and each one deserved their own name as well. But this time, Levine was late to the party, as these four bases had actually already been discovered and named. Yes, Levine was the first to find these bases in DNA, but these specific chemicals had already been discovered. This one was first discovered in bird poop, or guano, and was therefore named guanine. This one was found in the human thymus gland, and was thus named thymine. And this one was named adenine, and this one cytosine. So adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine are the four nitrogenous bases of DNA. And just another term that scientists use, these two nitrogenous bases that have two rings are referred to as purines, and these two are pyrimidines. So the next step was to figure out, how do these nucleotides join together to build the larger DNA molecule? Well, Levine had a guess. He reasoned that, hey, maybe they just combine like this, with one of each type of nucleotide. And Levine loved this idea so much, he gave it a name. Four in Greek is tetra, kind of like tetras. So Levine called this idea his tetranucleotide hypothesis. And in fact, for over 20 years, People believed Levine that this is what DNA looked like. It wasn't until around 1950 when a man named Erwin Shargaff came along and put Levine's hypothesis to the test. Shargaff reasoned that if DNA did look like this, with one of each type of nucleotide, then if he grabbed any random sample of DNA and counted the nucleotides, then shouldn't he find the ratio of nucleotides to be equal? So Shargaff tested it. He grabbed some human cells, extracted the DNA, and counted. And guess what? He did not find 25% of each. So Shargaff realized that Levine's hypothesis was wrong. But Shargaff wanted to be really sure, so he tried it again with chicken DNA. And he got these results. And then he tried grasshopper DNA. And after trying 12 different species, not once did he find equal amounts of A, T, C, and G. Instead, he noticed a different pattern. It seemed that, no matter which species he was looking at, the amount of adenine always equaled thymine, and the amount of cytosine always equaled guanine. And this was a very interesting finding, because this was not what one would expect had Levine's hypothesis been true. So Shargaff published his findings, which eventually became famously known as Shargaff's Rules. So great, Shargaff's Rules showed that the tetranucleotide hypothesis was wrong, but then, what's right? How do these nucleotides actually combine to form large DNA molecules? Linus Pauling, whom we mentioned in our last video, took a stab at this. Remember, this guy was kinda famously smart, so tons of people were excitedly waiting to see what Pauling came up with. And among those waiting were two young men, a 25-year-old ornithologist, bird expert, and a 35-year-old physicist, James Watson and Francis Crick. 
Now, these guys weren't well liked. They talked a lot, but didn't do much, and Watson especially was known to be racist and sexist. But there they were, excitedly waiting to see what Pauling came up with. And in January 1953, Pauling published his paper. Watson and Crick immediately jumped up and opened Pauling's paper to see if he'd figured it out, and they saw this, Pauling's triple helix. As you can see, Pauling claimed that individual nucleotides combined with nitrogenous bases sticking out and the phosphate groups facing inward. And Watson and Crick took one look at Pauling's triple helix and realized that this couldn't be correct. Remember, phosphate groups are negatively charged, so there's no way that a bunch of them could just face each other in the middle like that. They would repel each other. Pauling's triple helix must be wrong. So Watson and Crick realized that this was their chance to figure out DNA structure for themselves. So they sat down and started making cardboard cutouts of nucleotides, and tried to literally piece things together by hand. But they weren't getting anywhere. At least, not until they started talking to a third scientist, Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin was also interested in determining DNA structure, but unlike Watson and Crick, who were using cardboard cutouts, Franklin had more sophisticated technology, X-ray crystallography. Now, X-ray crystallography sounds super complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. In essence, imagine that you're shooting laser beams at a flat surface. What'll obviously happen is that the lasers will bounce back in straight lines and at the same angles. But what if the surface isn't flat? Let's say it looks like this. Then the lasers would bounce at these angles. The angles that the lasers bounce is unique to what the surface looks like. So you can imagine that even if we didn't know what our surface looked like, and we instead only knew the patterns by which lasers bounced off, then we could essentially go backwards and use the patterns to figure out what our surface looks like. And if you switch out lasers with x-rays and the surface with crystals of molecules, that's x-ray crystallography. It's essentially a way of determining what tiny molecules look like. In reality, the process also involves some advanced math known as the Fourier transform, which I won't get into, but if you want to learn more about the Fourier transform, I suggest watching this wonderful video by 3Blue1Brown. So Franklin does crystallography on DNA, and she gets this picture. Now Franklin, a crystallography expert, immediately realized that this photo meant that DNA must be a double helix, not a triple helix like Pauling had predicted. However, as history puts it, Franklin was very cautious and didn't like to prematurely come to conclusions, so she wanted more data to be sure. But while Franklin was collecting this extra data, Watson and Craig managed to get hold of Franklin's photo. The details are complicated, some say that Watson and Crick stole the photo, others say that they had fair access to it, but regardless, Watson and Crick had Franklin's photo, and they too realized, double helix. So they went back to their cardboard cutouts, pieced everything together, and came up with this. Their model was beautiful, and it turned out to be absolutely correct. Now, I want you to pay attention to a couple of DNA's features. First, notice how the spaces between the helix aren't all the same size. This groove is larger than this one, so they're respectively called the major groove and minor groove. Because the major groove is larger, it's more susceptible for things to attach or bind to it, which is something we'll come back to in the next few videos. Now, let's unwind the helix and look more closely. Remember that DNA actually isn't flat, but looking at it this way will help us analyze DNA better. Notice how DNA is made of two strands. Each strand consists of many nucleotides and is therefore called a polynucleotide strand. The nucleotides combine together by forming covalent bonds between the phosphate group of one nucleotide and the sugar of the next nucleotide, so these bonds are appropriately called phosphodiester bonds. And notice that the two strands interact with each other as well. The nitrogenous bases in each strand face each other and form hydrogen bonds across. Note that A always pairs with T, and C always pairs with G. Not only does this make sense chemically, because the hydrogens are in the perfect place to hydrogen bond, but this also explains Shargaff's rules. It makes sense. 
Something else to keep in mind is that hydrogen bonds are much weaker than covalent bonds. So while it wouldn't be difficult to separate the two strands, it'd be much harder to break the strands themselves. Thus, these two strands are often called the backbone of DNA. And since they consist of the sugar and phosphate components of nucleotides, they're more specifically called the sugar phosphate backbone. And one more thing, the two strands appear to be parallel, but if you look at the individual nucleotides, you'll notice that they face opposite directions in each strand. You could say that the two strands are anti-parallel, and as you'll see in the next few videos, this bidirectionality is really important. So scientists needed a way to label which direction is which. They could have gone with west and east, or left and right, but instead, scientists went with something more specific. Remember how I said that the sugar in each molecule has 5 carbons? Well, scientists realized that they could give each of these carbons a number, with the number 1 carbon, or 1 prime carbon, being attached to the nitrogenous base, and the number 5 carbon, or 5 prime carbon, being attached to the phosphate. And looking at these numbers, we can see a difference between the two strands. In this strand, the 5 prime carbon is on the left side, and the 3 prime carbon is on the other side. And on the other strand, the opposite is true. Thus, each direction of DNA is labeled either 5 prime or 3 prime. But as beautiful as this structure is, there's still one question that needs to be answered. How did scientists figure out that DNA contains the instructions to make proteins? To be fair, even before Watson and Crick figured out what DNA looked like, scientists did already suspect that DNA contained information of some sort. This is because earlier in 1944, scientists Avery, McCarty, and McLeod discovered that if you transfer DNA from a deadly bacteria to harmless bacteria, the harmless bacteria suddenly became deadly. So scientists were aware that DNA seemed to carry information of some sort. They just didn't know what information that was. In fact, it was none other than Crick himself who realized that the information that DNA contained was the instructions to make proteins. He simply looked at the way that DNA was structured, and he noticed that if you focused only on the nitrogenous basis, then the DNA looked like a sort of message, a sort of code. Like maybe ATG was an instruction for the cell to start making a protein, and maybe CAC meant to make a different part of a protein. And in 1958, just five years after proposing his double helix model, Francis Crick published his sequence hypothesis for protein synthesis, in which he stated in his own words, the nucleic acid sequence is a simple code for the sequence of a particular protein. And I'll leave you there. I could have talked about so much more, like how this DNA that we've been talking about this entire video actually isn't the only type of DNA. In fact, it's called B-form DNA. And there also exists A-DNA and Z-DNA, but these are far less common. I could also talk about how chromosomes actually aren't composed of just nucleic acids, but do contain proteins called histones. I could even talk about how bacteria actually don't even have a nucleus, and their DNA is in a circular shaped chromosome. But the most important thing I hope you got out of this video is that biology isn't some voodoo magic or a bunch of rules teachers make you memorize. All of science is careful experimentation and logical thinking, and I hope that going through all of these experiments has given you a more intuitive sense of DNA. In the next video, we'll take a look at DNA replication. There's less history to go with that, but there's still a lot of fascinating science to be learned. Thank you to everyone who supported the series. If you did enjoy this video and want to learn more, all I ask is that you subscribe and show this video to a friend. Let's grow and foster a love for biology together. As always, keep on appreciating.